Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This webcast is part of the ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I am Will Trace, Lockheed Martin Fellow Emeritus, former chair of ACM SIGSOF and ACM SIG Micro, and a member of the ACM Professional Development Committee. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to do and offer, here's more information. ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in a constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature, leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and research, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing and AC, Turing and ACM Prize in Computing Awards, and the ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. Before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on the slide in front of you. If you have any questions at any time, please type them in using Zoom's Q&A feature. I'll organize the questions as Margaret speaks and we'll try to get to as many as possible. The session is being recorded and will be archived you'll receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out and help us improve our tech talks. Today's presentation is Seismic Shifts, Challenges and Opportunities in Post-ISA. Era of Computer System Design by Margaret Martinosi. Margaret Martinosi is a Hugh Trumbull Adam, class of 35 professor of computer science at Princeton University. Her research interests are in computer architecture and hardware software interface issues in both classical and quantum computing systems. Dr. Martosi Martinosi is a member of the US National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is a fellow of ACM and IEEE. She was the 2021 recipient of the ACM Eckert Malshi Award. Margaret, without further ado, take it away. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, I appreciate everyone who's taken the time to join. Uh, let me get my screen shared. Great. I hope that this uh, is showing up as you expected to. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's it's wonderful to have this chance to speak with all of you in this way. Um, as the introduction said, my talk is about seismic shifts. And in particular, I use this picture here often to speak about the changes in our computing landscape um, because this is an area in the Western United States in which sedimentary rock layers used to be layered one on top of each other, um, but over time got tilted, got seismically shifted. And it seems as if we're going through a similar kind of set of shifts in the stack on which we have built computer systems for many years. Uh, so my talk will talk about how this is playing out both in the classical and in the quantum side of the landscape. So without further ado, here we go. Uh, probably many of you are familiar with the notion of Moore's law, uh, that notion that uh, the number of transistors that we could cost effectively fit on chip would scale double roughly every 12, 18, or 24 months, depending on when you looked at Moore's law. Uh, and this graph shows 40 years of that trend data. 
Um, and so basically a lot of what you see here might not be news to you. There are the transistor scalings, and you can see how other indicators of microprocessor trends have shifted already. For example, the number of logical cores on a chip. So while this isn't maybe new to many people, I think what is less talked about is how these factors, the shift to parallelism and the shift to heterogeneous parallelism in particular has essentially hindered or broken how software scales in performance, reliability, security, and cost. And in particular, uh, if I wanna sort of take another trip in the Wayback Machine, Actually, roughly the same year that Gordon Moore was sketching out Moore's law, the term computer architecture was coined. And you can see that it was coined in this Amdahl, Blau and Brooks uh, paper from IBM in 1964. Down here in the footnote, which I've sort of blown up here, it's this notion of hardware software abstraction, you know, architecture being the attributes of the system as seen by the programmer. And the value of that abstraction in allowing different hardware implementations to run the same software. Uh, so that was over 50 years ago now. Um, here we are today. Uh, chips today have massive heterogeneity. Uh, dozens of different instruction set architectures are represented on the same chip, plus different accelerators as well that operate essentially without an instruction set architecture. In addition, there's different types of memory and data heterogeneity, and there's different types of memory consistency models. So if there was a notion that we have one uh, sort of language that the chip speaks and one software interface for it, we have lost that notion over time. Uh, and it's time to re-examine how we program software and how we build systems in response to this. So to sort of put this in clear uh, perspective, uh, we're entering what I brashly call a post-ISA world. Uh, that is to say, instruction set architectures, that hardware software interface that we've talked about, those are still useful, but they aren't the enduring and universal abstraction layer that they used to be. And we, we've now gone years since the point at which, um, for example, in the Apple processor series, um, it's been nearly 10 years that over half of the chip area has been devoted to accelerators that have no ISA at all. And in other systems, we're also seeing the instruction set architecture get hidden under other abstraction layers. And so as we as a field consider this post more post ISA future, we have to ask ourselves some questions and then as researchers go and answer them. So how should we, how should we um, sort of think about programming these highly, heterogene highly heterogeneous systems? And how should we manage the complexity of fast changing hardware and software given that we've lost the abstraction that used to buffer us from some of those fast changes? And also what technologies come next and how will they um, present new challenges of this sort to us? So in terms of end of more systems, I wanna bring up this picture of the classical layering. If you will, it's that picture of the seismic, uh, the, the sedimentary rocks that I showed on my first slide when they were still one on top of the other. And this is perhaps a very familiar layering to many of us, transistors down low, algorithms up high, and these layers that uh, we came over time to appreciate because of the way that they helped us abstract systems, separate out our community, play different positions in the systems building space, and overall scale up systems to great complexities and great functionality. Um, but because of the challenges that we're facing, uh, as we've lost some of these abstraction layers in the middle, it's time to rethink these layers, interfaces, and abstractions. And in fact, what we're already seeing in many cases is a shift towards these more application-specific tool flows and approaches uh, in which we've seen this already tailoring for particular application domains. A uh, sort of early and perhaps familiar example of this would have been uh, TensorFlow and, and TPUs, right? Where uh, we take uh, a high level programming language or programming environment and we drill all the way down to a particular implementation. Uh, but there are many more and there's many more possibilities here. And so what I wanna do is sort of take you on a tour of some of the work uh, in my group where we're exploring these different things in the context of particular examples. 
So one example is looking at graph analytics. So where there's been a tremendous amount of progress lately in terms of uh, dense matrix computation, uh, graph and sparse computations remain challenging for many different computer systems. And in particular, uh, one aspect of them that remains challenging are uh, memory bandwidth and memory latency issues. Uh, so we can build accelerators for certain parts of certain computations. Uh, we tend to, as we accelerate the compute, we tend to see increasingly large relative bottlenecks on the memory. And of all the things that we're challenged by, one of the things that is particularly challenging has to do with the operating system managing the pages for these very large data sets with sparse and irregular access patterns. So what we see empirically is that graph analytics codes have very high TLB miss rates, translation look aside buffer miss rates that cause high address translation overheads. Um, one technique that has been used over the years uh, to address those high TLB miss rates is called huge pages. And the name is pretty much what you think it is. It's a way to promote uh, the use of pages that are much larger than the handful of kilobytes that is the default in many operating systems. The challenge is when to use huge pages and how to develop policies for using them wisely. Uh, and so um, the graphs over here on the right, the top graph is basically to motivate the degree uh, to which uh, graph analytics actually have high miss rates uh, even when um, huge pages are possible, these transparent huge page options. Um, the problem in many cases is that modern OS policies use huge pages often too often due to a lack of application knowledge, due to a difficulty in predicting application behavior because of the irregularity of uh, these graph analytics memory reference patterns. So what we need are operating system techniques that can more intelligently manage huge pages in a way that is application or domain tailored. And in this case, we're looking at the domain of graph analytics. Um, and so what we can see from the bottom graph over here is here's a baseline without transparent huge pages in blue. And then in orange is a sort of default Linux use of transparent huge pages on a set of graph algorithms, so breadth first search and so forth. Um, what you can see is that in cases, and, and speed up is uh, the y-axis, so higher is better. And so what we can see is that for many of these cases, using transparent huge pages can actually uh, slow things down, uh, speed up less than one, uh, if memory is constrained, because it ends up uh, over uh, allocating relative to the memory that's available. Uh, so the example that I'm talking about here, the example of our work here, is to say that the challenge that transparent huge pages face is how to decide what to promote in terms of hot pages of data uh, when different types of access patterns are all mixed together. Within a graph, there could be some high degree nodes that get uh, accessed frequently, some low degree nodes that get accessed infrequently. And if those are on the same operating system page, it's very hard to know what to do with that page. Should it be huge or should it be small? Uh, so in our work, what we've done is use prior works um, for pre-processing the data to try to sort based on our best estimate of what will be high degree data and therefore frequent access pattern. And then couple that pre-processing with dynamic uh, promotion that says we're only going to promote to use these huge pages in cases where we see the, the sort of the amount of memory fragmentation that indicates it will be useful. So it's basically both uh, doing promotion based on the application and based on the context of how much memory is being used. When we put those two together, uh, we find that we get considerable speed ups uh, over uh, other default approaches. So close to a 2x speed up over uh, the, the small default pages of 4K pages alone, and close to the ideal transparent huge page performance while using m m a much smaller amount of the application footprint actually backed by huge pages. Uh, so that's one example of take an application domain, in this case, graph analytics, drill in carefully, 
understand the full stack technique. This is TLBs, which is in hardware. This is operating systems. This is a bit of data sets and algorithms. And then come up with optimization uh, pipes that go from algorithm to implementation in a way that's tailored for a particular application. The second one, also in this area of smart, sparse and graph applications, takes this idea further. It recognizes some of the same challenges, very little compute per uh, cache line, very little data reuse, uh, many accesses that go out to main memory, a lot of energy spent on those memory operations. And where prior work has often mitigated the memory latency, the bandwidth and synchronization challenges in these kinds of applications remain a problem especially when you try to get up to very high core counts. So where the previous work on sort of adjusting transparent huge page policies was intended to work within existing operating systems, and indeed we've built it into existing Linux, this one goes further and it says, what would happen if we actually could change the hardware uh, and change the programming model to work with that new hardware? And so here, uh, what we're doing is looking at a, a new execution model and hardware that get put together. Um, and the basic uh, approach that we're looking at is where traditional compute uh, brings data to the compute. Uh, Dalarex, our approach uses a data local program execution model that basically says uh, there's a certain amount of data that lives with each tile. And when there's a computation that needs to be done on that data, it should be done by the tile that owns that data. Now, over the decades of parallel computing, there have been different aspects of data local compute. What we are resurfacing and re-examining here is the opportunity that we see because of the scale that's possible, either with wafer scale computation like Cerebrus or with chiplet-based approaches that can really scale out the number of processors and make these kinds of techniques newly interesting and newly important. Uh, so in this case, uh, the tiles themselves uh, can execute any task. Um, what distinguishes who does what is based on where the data lives. Uh, when we apply this to, again, that sort of family of large scale graph analytics problems, uh, what we see is that we can dramatically scale up the throughput uh, in terms of compute, uh, which is in red, operations per second, and in terms of the, the successful memory bandwidth, which is the blue here. Uh, so scaling up to around 16,000 processing elements, we can get to over two teraops per second, um, and a sort of considerable orders of magnitude performance over prior uh, techniques for improving performance and energy and graph analytics using more traditional uh, compute approaches. Um, the idea here is for sparse applications to reach the true limit of compute and network resources rather than being memory bottlenecked. Um, and there's a range of both application, compiler, and hardware uh, uh, tricks or techniques that are involved in achieving this that I won't have time to dig into in detail. Um, but the, the key idea is to sort of recognize, again, the opportunities that come from exploring a full stack approach. Uh, so here we are, uh, you know, with this sort of rethinking full stack approaches. I wanted to give, this is the ultimate and quick tour. Um, you know, if you had asked me to give this talk maybe three, four years ago, I would have taken you on a tour of a set of verification and security check tools that we developed in my group, again, with this notion of full stack approaches. I'm not gonna have time to talk through this, but it's more of that same approach of trying to work through how do new layering strategies impact the key aspects of performance, energy, reliability, programmability in our systems today and going forward. So this is basically a pointer if you're curious, you can check out this website for more information on this fam family of work. So that's, I, I promised you a whirlwind tour and uh, we're on track for a whirlwind tour. Um, we've gotten through some aspects of this first set of questions, how to program uh, for the, the sort of end of Moore's law era that we're in on the classical side and how to manage the complexity 
of what has become very fast changing hardware and software. Um, but the other interesting thing uh, to me and to my group has been answering the second question of what technologies come next and how can we bring to bear computing systems, computer architecture techniques on very new types of technologies as well. So let's go back to this graph, decades of Moore's law scaling as before, oops. Uh, so this is sort of 1970 to 2020, and this is mostly semiconductors. But what's interesting is to take this and put it into that a much longer context, a much longer timeline. And that's this. So instead of starting at 1970, this graph starts at 1900. And this graph goes way out. And what it, what it shows on the y-axis here, so x-axis is time as before, what it shows on the y-axis here is calculations per second for $1,000. So if you think back to what Gordon Moore was actually trying to articulate with Moore's Law, what he articulated with Moore's Law was a statement about the cost effectiveness of different transistor densities over time. Uh, and this graph is in many ways a similar statement about cost effective calculations per second over time. Uh, and so you can see that we've actually been um, on an amazing performance scaling journey that isn't just about the transistor era, the, the Moore's Law era, but actually reaches far back into electromechanical systems and basically aims us towards a set of questions. Here we are in sort of the 2020 and beyond era. What will be next to keep us on this kind of curve? What opportunities will we have? And um, in what ways will that disruptive moment be helpfully disruptive? And what ways will that disruptive moment um, be challenging to us? And so from that, uh, there's different possible options, right? Uh, some people are looking at different kinds of DNA computing devices. Some people are looking at different kinds of optical computing devices. Um, in, in my group over the past 12 years or so, uh, we've increasingly been trying to understand uh, the role of computer architects in advancing quantum computing as a possible, um, having a possible role in answering these questions of cost-effective compute over time. So uh, quantum computing uh, in a whirlwind tour can be challenging, but uh, here's a few sort of introductory overview points. So quantum computing in many ways has its roots back in a set of researchers about four decades ago who articulated a goal of simulating the physical world. And one of those researchers, Feynman, put it like this. Um, he was giving a talk in which he tried to envision how would we do very detailed quantum mechanical systems? And he started to think about, you know, for a large system with R particles, uh, he started to realize that scaling up those kinds of quantum mechanical simulations would actually scale in volume of compute required, in amount of energy required, at such a rate that he couldn't conceive of any way the classical computer could keep up at a practical volume, at a practical level. And so for him, he said, to actually simulate these things faithfully in detail, uh, the computer itself should be built out of quantum mechanical elements which obey quantum mechanical laws. And thereby you get to something that's a little bit closer to emulation um, than simulation. And uh, in his thought experiment, he got to the point where he felt this would be the cost-effective uh, volume effective way of simulating in detail the physical world. And so he articulated this vision for a computer built of quantum mechanical elements in order to simulate quantum mechanical systems. So uh, from that, we were basically off to the races. Uh, you know, this was a vision. And then what we've done over the decades is try to execute towards that vision. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what quantum computing rests on. Um, and this is where, uh, you know, there's different levels of detail that I could give, obviously. I'm going to give a, a pretty high level intro view. Uh, apologies to, to folks who, um, for whom this is too high level, and apologies for 
the, for the folks for whom this isn't enough. Uh, but here we go. There are two key enablers you can think about for quantum, for speed ups to be gotten from a quantum computing setup. One would be around the, the ability of uh, to have superposition of states within a quantum bit or a qubit. Um, so the idea that is often sort of put forward is that a qubit isn't just one or zero, but it is some probabilistic superposition of states. Um, and in that large and probabilistic representation of possibilities, the state space scales much faster with each qubit um, than in a binary system where it truly is either one or zero and nothing else. The second thing that is a key enabler of quantum speedups is called entanglement, entanglement of states between qubits. And this is the notion that there's correlation between qubit states once entangled. And Einstein refers, referred to this as spooky action at a distance. So um, here's a, a very high level uh, attempt to be intuitive about the notion of entanglement of states between qubits. Uh, let's imagine that we have two coins um, and you know, so entanglement has never been demonstrated on anything as large as a coin, but let's imagine for a second that we have two coins and uh, we do something to them. We have an operation that allows us to entangle their states. Uh, and that in quantum computing is roughly speaking a gate operation that, that imposes some degree of entanglement. Uh, once they are entangled, for some amount of time after that entanglement, their states are correlated. And so if I separate them, uh, their states remain correlated such that if I look at one of these coins and see that it's heads, I get some information about whether the other coin is heads or tails, even though it's very far away. And it's that notion of entanglement uh, that that uh, actually adds to the capabilities of these quantum systems. So together, these properties support novel algorithms, completely different ways of thinking that can explore large, represent and explore large state spaces faster, sometimes exponentially faster than classical computing. So where are we? Um, I mentioned uh, Feynman's vision back in the 80s, uh, but another key, sort of milestone in quantum computing uh, was Shor's factoring algorithm in the 1990s and similarly Grover's algorithm. So I've shown those two um, in blue on this graph. So this graph is a timeline, 1995 to the present and beyond. Um, and in blue are the different algorithmic milestones that we've reached. In yellow are some of the uh, sort of very rough line showing some of the implementation milestones that we've been reaching uh, in terms of qubit counts. So the yellow is sort of the qubit counts that we know how to build. Uh, and the blue are our best estimates of the number of reliable qubits that we will need in order to implement these algorithms at let's call it interesting levels. So for Schwarz factoring algorithm to be implemented in a way that actually could decrypt something um, encrypted for commercial purposes today, we would need tens of thousands uh, or even millions of reliable qubits. Uh, so clearly there's a big gap between the needs of Shor's algorithm and the yellow line that we see here. One set of advances that we've seen are a set of new algorithms that came in roughly 10 years ago. Uh, that started to show that there were opportunities for uh, other ways of other types of algorithmic approaches in quantum that had much lower qubit requirements. And so there's some promise there. Uh, what we have sort of entered now is an area, is an era that uh, Preskill refers to as noisy intermediate scale quantum, which is sort of this 10 to 1000 qubits. Uh, it's too small for things like Shor's algorithm that are sort of opined to have exponential speed ups. Uh, it is um, largely too small for error correcting codes, although we're starting to see a lot of progress on ECC these days in quantum systems. It is large enough to support interesting experiments without ECC, 
And in fact, there's a range of cloud-connected quantum platforms that we can all make use of and that have been profoundly impactful on our ability to think about computer systems solutions to what's next here. So there's a gap. And if you're a computer systems person, then you look at gaps like that between algorithms and devices and you say, well, how can we help? How can we pitch in? And so quantum programming and design tools that shrink this gap can move the feasibility or the usability point uh, for quantum computing years earlier, either by reducing algorithm qubit requirements or by improving the effectiveness of hardware qubits or by simply making use of systems in novel ways. So just as I gave some examples on the classical side, I'm gonna step through a couple examples on the, on the quantum side of things for how we might go forward and do some of this. So uh, one of these I would call mind the gap. Uh, and as I said on this previous slide, these NISC quantum systems, we can use them, but they're pretty small to use for things that are uh, sort of commercially useful, that are sort of better than um, the classical alternatives and so forth. And so uh, one question is, uh, if most algorithms require a large and reliable quantum processing unit or QPU, um, but building those quantum processing units is still challenging, um, how can we make use of smaller QPUs in a patchwork quilt kind of way? And so I, I want to um, sort of pause here and say, say something about how we measure the capability of quantum systems and explain this perhaps non-intuitive or surprising statement here. Uh, so there's a notion, there's different ways that you could sort of quantify the capability of a quantum system. You might try just counting qubits and seeing how you do, but it's been sort of demonstrated that counting qubits isn't the only or the best way to quantify the capability of a system, because if you have a few really good qubits that might be better than a lot of uh, noisy or less well-behaved qubits. And so, for example, within uh, the set of um, computers that are uh, made available uh, by IBM, uh, there's a smallish one, a 27 qubit uh, machine, that actually has twice the capability, or uh, as it's termed, the quantum volume of a much higher qubit count uh, machine within the same family. And that's simply a demonstration of the fact that this larger machine um, is, is newer. Uh, they're still working on noise management and so forth for it. And so its overall capability or quantum volume isn't as high as the 27 qubit machine that's been around a little bit longer. So we, we want the effect of having large QPUs but it's still much easier to build smaller QPUs. And so it's a very natural computer systems designer question to say, can we make use of multiple small QPUs to run large target applications? And when you ask that question, uh, you get into issues of modularity or of quote unquote, cutting the circuit. And I don't have time to go through all the different design options, but I am gonna give one example, uh, which is the notion of um, cutting quantum circuits uh, to allow qu large quantum algorithms to run on relatively smaller prototypes. Uh, so if you have used um, an FPGA emulator or something like that in your computing life, then you probably um, are familiar with the notion that on the classical side of our world, we can take a large circuit and cut it into parts that will fit into an FPGA emulator and then have interface lines that run between the FPGA emulator to essentially connect different uh, chunks of the circuit that we're trying to emulate. When you take those ideas and you bring them to the quantum side, um, there's a part that's intuitive. You can, in fact, cut quantum circuits into smaller circuits that fit and that fit. Um, the challenge is that classical reconstruction scales exponentially. So when you cut a wire in a quantum circuit, um, you actually not just simply have to pass a single signal from one side to the other, but you have to consider that superposition of states and the complexity of the state space 
represented by that particular um, uh, connection in the circuit. So here's a quantum circuit. Uh, these are gates. Uh, the different rows here are considered different qubits that are having operations applied to them. So what can we do? We can select a point uh, that we'd like to cut, and it's shown by a red X here. And by selecting that point that we'd like to cut, we take what is a five qubit circuit. You can see Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. So this full thing is a five qubit circuit, and we can instead have uh, two sub circuits each of which require no more than three qubits a piece. Uh, and then the red indicates a need for this reconstruction. Um, this reconstruction is basically a really high-end uh, tensor computation. Uh, and so the classical reconstruction, so once you decide you wanna go down this path, you solve some problems on the quantum side, by sort of creating uh, an HPC problem on the classical side, on the classical side. And our solution there has been to try different approaches. We first tried a parallel processing uh, reconstruction step on, um, on regular CPUs. And then we tried a GPU based approach um, that really takes advantage of GPUs being optimized for these kinds of tensor computations. Uh, so what we see is that we can now actually extend the scale of um, the kinds of circuits that can be simulated relative to simulating them on classical systems alone. We're starting to be able to extend the scale to the point where um, this is a really interesting alternative. Uh, I won't get into lots of detail, um, except to say that these are four different modest circuits that we're taking to up to 100 qubits. And then we cut and run them uh, with different kinds of uh, GPU reconstructions. So, sorry, CPU or GPU reconstructions. Uh, the the y-axis in all of these is time, so lower is better. And so what you can see are that the, the, the GPU-based reconstruction is the, the fastest back end and we can reconstruct up to fairly large circuits. Um, we can also use uh, this approach to focus computation on just the parts of a quantum prototype that have the best noise behavior. And in so doing, we actually get higher fidelity than if we used a single large monolithic QPU where we had to use all of the qubits, not just the good ones. So we can either make it faster than classical simulation, or we can use it to be selective about which qubits to use. Um, but we are really um, sort of optimistic about the role of these kinds of techniques in advancing through this uh, noisy intermediate scale quantum or NISC era. Uh, so you know, in a single takeaway, it's that um, a, a small quantum circuit plus our cut QC approach can be better than a large quantum circuit in different ways. So uh, moving along, um, let's go back to uh, this notion of uh, sort of an analogy, if you will. Um, so quantum systems today, uh, you've seen this layer chart a few times in my uh, talk already. You can think back to where we were in the 1950s of classical computing. In the 1950s of classical computing, uh, we had algorithms up high. We had implementations based on vacuum tubes and relay circuits down low. We had assembly language. We didn't have the notion of an architecture. I showed you that paper from 1964, which is where the notion of an architecture came into being. In 1950s, that's when the notion of a compiler was invented and so forth. So if you look at 1950 itself, uh, there was a lot we didn't have yet, and we built out this stack. For quantum tool flows, we're at a similar place. Uh, we have some qubit implementations, superconducting qubits, trapped ion, and so forth, uh, and we have algorithms up high, and I showed you that graph that showed the gap between them. We're still deciding what goes between, just as we spent the 50s, 60s, and beyond deciding what goes between in this classical stack. We have a little bit of a to-do list of what we know ought to go in between, 
um, and we're still sorting out how to work on that. So I want to give one more example here that really gets to this notion of sort of sorting out some of this, and in particular, thinking about these full stack um, uh, approaches, very similar to the full stack examples that I gave on the classical side. And so here, uh, this is a domain specific approach. And the domain here is called Hamiltonian simulation. And Hamiltonian simulation, in a nutshell, is back to that problem from a few slides ago that really motivated Feynman in the first place. How, how might we simulate quantum mechanical systems in detail, he said. And his answer was, oh, we, could use, uh, we could use quantum mechanical elements. Uh, so that's how far he got. Uh, but the question is how to actually act on that and how to use our understanding of algorithm and application trade-offs uh, to design different systems accordingly. And as we've drilled into this, one of the things that we've found is that often there are choices that allow you to improve algorithmic accuracy, but they come at the cost of what are called deeper circuits or circuits with more gates. And in the noisy era, the more gates you have, the more noise compounds. And so you're basically, if you insist on high algorithmic accuracy, it will come at the cost of imposing noisiness down the line in the implementation. So we come to this crossroads where we have a real issue of how to co-design between um, uh, how to optimize for algorithmic error and how to account for device error and come up to a balancing point. And so um, what one of my PhD students observed was the opportunity to uh, work on both in a way that allowed us to balance both of them. So in terms of algorithmic errors, uh, he recognized that you could express uh, Hamiltonian simulation in a way that there, where there were commuting arithmetic terms. And if you grouped those commuting terms together, you got to mitigate algorithmic errors without increasing uh, the the physical cost to the deeper circuits. Second of all, he found ways to mitigate the lower level device errors by sorting those terms using a traveling salesman problem. Uh, so this is, I think, what is kind of, it, it just uh, gives me great joy to watch this mix of physics and computing and math coming together in this full kind of full stack co-design to say, what's the best way to do this problem? And this problem is essentially you know, it should be one of the best problems for quantum since it's so tied to where quantum came from. And yet it still requires this richness of different fields and computer science expertise, meeting physics and math expertise to advance it well. Uh, so uh, we implemented this, uh, this balancing act. And what we found is indeed there are ways to simultaneously mitigate both algorithmic and physical errors if you're willing to consider them together rather than drawing these abstraction layers that separate them. And uh, so for yet another uh, time, I won't be able to go into detail, but the basic idea here is that uh, MCTSP is this work that mitigates uh, both the algorithmic errors through those um, commute approaches and the low level device errors through the traveling salesman approach. And it's able to bring down the gate cost tremendously. So it is this lowest of the blue lines. Um, so it has fewer gates and um, offers opportunities both now and into the future. So that just to kind of back up a second, the reason why fewer gates is of interest is because it allows either for better time performance or for better what's called success rate or accuracy quantum systems have sufficiently high noise levels that simply getting the right answer at the end um, is, is a figure of merit that we watch. And so these success rates um, are, are tied to gate counts in a way that we track. Okay, so I've given you a set of uh, two quantum examples one on how to cut quantum circuits and another on how to do different algorithmic tailorings. There are, just as I gave 
several qu classical examples. There are also several quantum examples that I didn't have time to give. A recurring theme across all of these is this notion of full stack knowledge from applications to hardware characteristics is important and will continue to be so. Um, and I think the other thing to note is the similarity of these approaches between the classical and the quantum side. So as we go forward, you know, I, I mentioned that we're in this crossroads where we're trying to figure out um, what to do with this blue box of to-do items. It is tempting to build a layering strategy like this. And indeed, there are folks talking about, oh, we should have uh, a quantum ISA so that we can build that abstraction layer. The minute you build that abstraction layer, you lose the opportunity uh, for some of the full stack optimizations uh, that we have found so beneficial. Uh, so the challenge really is in this in this world of very tight resource constraints and frankly, very challenging ability to get benefits out of uh, qubits that are often on the noisy side, we need more information flow up and down the stack in order to do the kinds of optimizations that I that I briefly spoke through here. So another opportunity is to take this quantum tool flows and to allow information flow up and down the stack about error characteristics, about communication latencies, connectivity, and so forth, application characteristics. And you saw that in the Hamiltonian simulation example. It was the willingness to consider algorithmic approaches and device approaches together that allowed us to get those wins. And had we kept them sort of rigidly separate across abstraction layers, we wouldn't have been able to. And so this, it can be surprising when an architect, um, you know, gives a talk and says, uh, this might not be a good idea. We might need these application specific and full stack approaches. Um, it can be surprising, but then again, think of classical accelerators that have, that have also shifted that way, as I said in the first half of the talk. And so where are we? Um, well, quantum computing is not solely Moore's law replacement. Um, it's unique special purpose hardware. Uh, it has promise on certain focused applications. It is potentially game changing. Um, and uh, for its particular um, place where it shows promise, it could literally make the intractable tract tractable. We're also seeing cases where lessons we learned in the quantum side of our research are flowing back and driving innovation on the classical side as well. So we're seeing a lot of benefit in going both directions. Uh, within my group, we have both classical and quantum folks working, and we can see all the places where we're learning across that boundary. It's clear that a full CS ecosystem is needed to shift quantum from theoretical to commercial. Uh, so back to this picture overall and to consider both classical and quantum systems, uh, you know, this is where we are. Um, that's not to say that the problem is solved, but it's to say that this is sort of a surprising operating point, both on the classical side, you see it in our accelerator-oriented parallelism and TPUs and Cerebrus and so forth. And you also see it in our quantum cases as well. So overall, the seismic shift is in going from this to this. And I think the ask of all of us is, um, how are we gonna respond to this shift most effectively? Uh, it's clear that it will require essentially an all of computing shift to accommodate it in our curricula, uh, in our systems designs and in our programming models. And so with that, uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, I would be happy to field some questions. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, let's move on to the questions and answers now. I must say that this was an interesting talk and that there were a lot of interesting questions. And I guess I'm going to start out with asking you to back up a bit and talk exactly what is noise with respect to uh, some of the people, uh, attendees were not familiar with the concept and how significant noise is in the quantum computing realm. Ah, great. So um, noise refers to the fact that in quantum computing, um, gates have errors. And, and so this comes about, you know, so first of all, it's a relatively new technology. And so um, we're, we're still managing the, the, the sort of precise control that's needed. But second of all, the state space is not simply one or zero. Uh, but the state space is this rich and continuous state space. And so 
it's much harder to come up with precise control that can represent that kind of uh, uh, rich uh, superposition of states. And so therefore, each time you operate on a qubit, there's a bit of error that occurs. And in addition, there's a bit of error that uh, will happen simply because of over time, that state will uh, change in ways that also uh, don't fully reflect what you intended in the computation. And so we refer to all of that as noise. It's all the places where our sort of perfect ideal representation of a state is not fully reflected in the physics of the qubit as we have it on the system. Thank you. Uh, is entanglement the only way qubits interact and can multiple qubits be entangled? Um, yeah, actually the ability to, uh, the ability to entangle more and more qubits is how you actually get to um, the kind of exponential potential advantage that um, that shows the most promise for quantum. So uh, yes, the goal is to be able to entangle um, many qubits. Okay, so I'm sort of in the uh, acronym tar pit here. What's your opinion of IQM, the startup which also uses a co-design approach but implements the quantum system specialized for an application? Um, I, I'm, I don't think it's my role to kind of opine on different companies or their, their approaches. So um, I'm going to leave that one for others to ponder. Okay. How about something? Who is leading the race to advances in technology, quantum technology? Uh, so, so let me go back to my, um, my analogy. So, so 1950 in classical computing. Uh, think about it. Uh, in 1950, we built computers out of vacuum tubes and relay circuits. Uh, we had invented a transistor in 1950, or I mean, we invented it in 1947, uh, but it wasn't being used in computers yet. Um, and it wouldn't be used in computers until later in that decade. We built radios out of transistors in 1950, but we didn't build computers out of transistors in 1950. So what I love about this analogy is it, it helps people stop and pause and think. If you were picking a winner in 1950 for the technology that you thought would win the classical computing race, uh, you might be forgiven for picking uh, vacuum tubes or relay circuits because that was what was all around you and transistors were not um, being used for compute. And so I genuinely think we're at a similar spot in uh, the in the quantum computing world where we have some implementation possibilities that are the the leading contenders right now like superconducting qubits like trapped ion and so on there's some other uh, jargony things that I could pull out here um, but it's really too soon to tell what will win in terms of scalability uh, to useful sizes uh, and the other sort of aspects that are gonna make the technology take off. And so to me, uh, one of the things that's really exciting are the ways in which we can do research that doesn't tie to a particular technology. So in, in my group, we've done compilers that target multiple technologies. So we've done compilers that uh, through a single flow, a single approach can target either superconducting or trapped ion relatively agnostic to the technology. And that's been really helpful um, for letting us navigate these kinds of questions without needing to pick a winner too soon. Thank you. Um, I'm looking through the list here. Um, how significant is noise in smaller G, uh, QPU circuits? And I'd like to... Uh, say there was another question, what is the minimal number of qubits, assuming all interconnected for a small quantum computer to be used together with a classical computation unit to achieve speed up compared to similar in size and or power to a classical computer? Now, I don't know whether you were able to pull a question out of those two, uh, those two statements. So there are, there are um, 
there are a range of cloud connected quantum computing prototypes that are out there for people to use. Frankly, you know, many are quite open for you to go and experiment with, and it's pretty interesting. And, and so some of those are on the order of, you know, a five qubit machine. Uh, it's connected to a classical computer because it's on the cloud, right? And so you can experiment with them. Um, in, in terms of the notion of how many qubits will it take to, to show quantum advantage to beat a classical machine, um, that's a much more complicated question than perhaps uh, the asker intended. So that's a super hard question um, because basically, uh, just as we see in many different kind of technology evolution stories, um, when the new or disruptor technology advances a bit, uh, the other technologies figure out ways to advance also. And so there's this constant interplay back and forth that, um, you know, we might, uh, we might see quantum advantage or quantum supremacy or whatever being uh, spoken about for a particular context, but then over time, the classical side of things will advance and show uh, advantage again. So we're still seeing um, where this will land, uh, but certainly as you get up above uh, sort of 50, 60, 70 qubits, you're in a range where with the right noise levels and with the right orchestration, there should be some very powerful computations um, that can be achievable. Okay. Yeah. Here's a comment. Great talk. Thank you. I was wondering what your thoughts would be on different qubit implementations. You sort of touched that on that superconducting, trapped ion, et cetera. A lot of work seems to be to abstract down to the gate level. Do we all need to go lower or should most work transfer easily regardless of qubit design? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. You know, so a lot of my talk was about saying that we needed to be open to the full stack going up and down. Um, but it's true that many of our optimizations are at this gate level and don't, don't always go further from the gate level down to the actual device. Um, some of the ways in which the device itself can matter um, that, or are beyond what I could talk about in this whirlwind tour. Uh, but for example, uh, Let's compare trapped ion and superconducting. Um, trapped ion systems uh, tend to have uh, excellent ability to be able to do entangled gates up to the size of what's called the trap. And so they're quite good um, for entanglement of whatever that is, maybe five qubits, maybe a few more, um, where and then they hit a step function of challenge, which is, you know, how do you communicate between traps? So there are places where those device characteristics and the device trade-offs uh, do shape things that you might do in terms of compilation, in terms of programming, and um, in a way that goes beyond simply what the gate level can, can fully express. Um, but it's true that many of us, much of the time, might be able to just get away with thinking about from the gate level up, um, but bearing in mind that which gates you have access to is often tailored to the devices as well. There's, there's different, quote unquote, native gates that work well with different technologies. But, um, do, would you recommend any resources for the interested reader to... Uh access in particular conferences, journals, or uh, particular university websites? Um, well, I would say that, um, like I said, there's, there's several uh, cloud-connected quantum resources that are out there uh, it, it, with excellent educational resources that go along with them. Um, and so it, basically many of the major um, industry players in the quantum space have excellent educational resources that go along with their cloud connected platforms. Um, so that includes Microsoft, it includes IBM, uh, 
and and there's now a Google quantum virtual machine that's available on Google Cloud platform as well. So I'm, I'm trying to be expansive in my answer because there really are several of these opportunities out there and I hope I haven't forgotten anyone in naming those ones. Okay, last question, my question. Are there any intellectual property constraints that are being um, driven by the, or motivated by the quantum computing community? It seems pretty open to me. Um, well, I mean, there's a lot of different players in the space, some of whom are uh, universities and some of whom are industry. Uh, I think there's a fair amount of uh, initial sort of prototype level uh, technology that's available for folks to quote unquote play around with. Um, but certainly uh, as, as different entities, whether university researchers or large companies or small startups, as different entities develop uh, techniques that they consider to be key to their success, key to their approach, um, there's there's IP at work there, and uh, that's great. That's how a, an economic um, yes. advantage comes out of a technical advantage. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time, and I'd like to thank Margaret again for her informative presentation and insightful answers to many of our questions. A special thanks also goes out to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate today. This talk was recorded and will be available online in a few days at learning.acm.org. You can find announcements on upcoming talks and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Also, please fill out our quick survey where you can suggest future topics or speakers, which you should be seeing on your screen now. On behalf of ACM and Margaret Marcondosi and myself, we'll trace Thanks again for joining us, and I hope you will join us again in the future. This concludes our talk. Thank you.